Welcome to the Dr. Journal Club Podcast, the show that goes under the hood of evidence-based integrative medicine. We review recent research articles, interview evidence-based medicine thought leaders, and discuss the challenges and opportunities of integrating evidence-based and integrative medicine. Continue your learning after the show at www.drjournalclub.com. Please bear in mind that this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Talk to your doctor before making any medical decisions, changes, etc. Everything we're talking about, that's to teach you guys stuff and have fun. We are not your doctors. Also, we would love to answer your specific questions. On drjournalclub.com, you can post questions and comments for specific videos. But go ahead and email us directly at josh at drjournalclub.com. That's josh at drjournalclub.com. Send us your listener questions and we will discuss it on our pod. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Dr. Journal Club podcast with Josh and Adam. So we were going to finish up the um, the article and we got we finished the methods and we were going to jump into the results. Okay, so last time we uh, went through the sort of on the off the cuff uh, intro to a new paper and the methods, and today we wanted to break into the results section for you. So, um, Adam, do you want to pick it up with the results, or um, how would you like to proceed, sir? Yeah, so let's go ahead and I just show this way uh, in case anyone's kind of confused as to what's going on because we will we'll be. Oh yeah, remind them what we're talking episodes. about. Yeah, yeah. So part one. Uh, we talked about uh, the methods and the introduction, and just some background information uh, on a really interesting paper that Dr. Bill Walter um, sent us. Thanks, Bill, for sending that uh, or sending this, this article. Um, and he sent us a, a, a publication from JAMA uh, titled The Effect of Pain Reprocessing Therapy versus Placebo and Usual Care for Patients with Chronic Back Pain. So basically, Pain reprocessing therapy, for those who don't know, in short, is basically like a pain re-education um, type of treatment plan, very much sort of uh, uh, around sort of like cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, and specifically for pain. And they're, what they're doing is comparing it to uh, usual care uh, versus open label placebo, meaning I am giving you something that is inert. It sh- does not have any sort of therapeutic properties into it, um, but it may give you some benefit. Um, so we're telling them that basically, um, and then comparing the three uh, interventions. So part one was all about sort of the background information and the methods and whatnot. In today's part two, uh, we're going to be talking about the results of this trial. And so when we look at the results, what they ended up doing is randomizing 151 participants, of which 54% were female for a mean age of 41, plus or minus 16 years. Uh, with a pain duration of 10 plus or minus 9 years. So everyone had pain for anywhere from 1 to basically 20 years of chronic low back pain. Mm -hmm. Uh, At at baseline, they reported low to moderate pain intensity on a scale of of 0 to 10. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so on average, they recorded a score of a 4 plus or minus 1. And then let's see what else here. Okay, of those who are in the pain reprocessing therapy group, 88% of them completed all treatment sessions, so very high, wow. yeah, um, yeah, very, very high uh, treatment completion uh, stan- uh, stan- from a standpoint of that. Uh, post-treatment, uh, let's see here, five dropped out prior to even starting, and then one had an unrelated medical emergency. So no one stopped the therapy because of, because of the therapy, it was all kind of just nebulous reasons. Um, Of those who were randomized to placebo, 86% received the treatment. So again, high completion rate. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then of the 50% who went to usual care, 94% completed the post-treatment assessment. So interesting. Uh, Would you say that that's maybe clinically relevant for uh, if it's not statistically significantly different uh, of let's say 94% in usual care versus uh, 88% in the therapy group? No, I, I consider that the same. And also really high compliance throughout. So I'm not too worried about dropouts or anything like that. Okay. Um, and then of 
20 participants in the pain reprocessing therapy group. Um, some had pre-existing spinal imaging, with one had a spinal anomaly. All of which showed at least one spinal anomaly. But it was not causal of pain. Okay, okay gotcha. They ruled out some confounders there. Awesome. Um, cool. Okay, so clinical outcomes. Uh, patients that were randomized to the pain reprocessing therapy had substantial reductions in their pain intensity at post-treatment compared to both the control mm -hmm. and the placebo group. Good. On average, they had a pain reduction of, let's round up to two. It was 1.79. Uh, so they, they improved their pain uh, on average by a two when compared to placebo. Oh, I see. Okay, so it's it's doing. Okay, so compare. It must be comparing endpoint scores to placebo. Oh, I I see. And then endpoint to the endpoint of the usual care. Okay, so they're not looking at pre post changes. I think they're looking at okay at the end of the treat the PRT. What was the score compared to the placebo group at the end compared to the usual care group at the end? I guess that's how I would read that. You know what? What we should just do, actually, is what I would typically do is instead of reading the results, why don't we just look at uh, yeah, table there we two? Go. Uh, because it's a lot simpler. Uh, I don't know why they did that from the get-go. It's probably because, again, I was on four hours of sleep getting ready for moving to across the country. Okay. <laughs> what you're doing in, like, two hours. <laughs> yeah. The, the Okay, so when we look at, at post-treatment, um, the pain reprocessing therapy versus the placebo um, improved by 1.14 uh, plus or minus a quarter of a point. And then and that was considered statistically significant. And then when they compared the pain reprocessing therapy to usual care, um, there was an improvement by, let's round up uh, and say two points on a zero to 10 scale um, with a standard deviation of 0.25, so plus or minus in either direction. And again, that was considered statistically significant. So, you know, if these people came in on a, right. with a baseline score of a four, um, compared to giving them open label placebo, that four went down to a three. And then compared to usual care, that pain went down from a four right. to a two. Right. Uh, yeah. So it's kind of like confusing. So I'm looking at it here and I'm going to, yeah, kind of ballparking these numbers. So it's like baseline pain level, everyone was around four. And then at the end of treatment, the PRT group, that's the special intervention that we're talking about, the pain reprocessing, that went down to just over one. So you go from a four to a one. In the placebo group, it goes to a, basically a four to a three, and then basically usual care is a four to a three as well. So you're having a pretty significant improvement. So you drop a point uh, for each of the control groups, but then you re you drop like two plus three points really um, with the intervention group. So that seems like a very large effect, like you said, all statistically significant. And then this is also kind of cool at one month, two month, three month, six and 12 month follow up. So a couple interesting things is the effect for placebo and usual care and the PRT all pretty much seem sticky, which you wouldn't necessarily expect with placebos. We're used to hearing about placebo effects being short term effects and not really lasting more than a month or two. But this bringing it down to three lasts all the way to 12 months with the placebo and usual care. And then interestingly, the PRT group is basically about the same too. It pops up a little bit, but it's still one a score of one and a half at a year out. So that is, it is a sticky effect and it is a dramatic effect, I would say, clinically significant and, you know, two to three times larger than we're seeing with the different control groups. Yeah. And then furthermore, it looks like here that just over two thirds of participants in the pain reprocessing therapy group were pain free or nearly pain free at post treatment compared to 20% in placebo and 10% in usual care. So that's really quite interesting. Yeah, this is really cool. So um, really, really, really impressive results, I would say. Um, and again, like we talked about, and if you didn't hear it last week, go ahead and check that out because there's really, we go into the methods a lot. They did a really good job with their active control, I think. Um, well, not active control, but like their placebo, open label placebo control. And I think they did a really good job, you know, controlling for all this stuff and still 
you have a much more dramatic impact with this PRT therapy. So I'm actually, uh, <laughs> I'm pretty excited. Um, I think I might, you know, want to explore where to send people for this one. So let's look at um, the the neuroimaging outcomes. I'm very curious about that. It was nice to have some objective markers too. Well, before we get in there, just the clinician and me, um, some of the secondary outcomes were actually are clinically important. So okay, let's go through them. They were, they were basically the results were kind of the same with regards to some of these secondary outcomes in the sense that uh, the pain reprocessing therapy compared to um, the placebo or the, the standard of care treatment groups um, had improvements in pain, depression, excuse me, uh, improvements in sleep and depression as well. Nice. So we're seeing important secondary clinically relevant outcome mm -hmm. movements as well. So very cool. I like that. Um, and then we have this, um, yeah, so this interesting, and you know, one of the things about pain is it's a subjectively reported outcome. And so lack of blinding is an issue, of course, because we know that subjectively reported outcomes have a lot of bias when you know what you're getting. And one of the ways you get around that or you would try to address that is by having a good comparator, which, you know, I don't think I've ever seen such a good comparator as in this study, which is kind of neat, but also is to get objective outcomes because we've got data that objective outcomes are not influenced by lack of blinding. And so I think they were trying to do that with this MRI images. So I'm kind of very curious to say, okay, now let's look at these objective levels. Um, what do we see here? Um, and it looks like patients who got the PRT reported significant pre-treatment to post-treatment reductions in evoked back pain. So if you recall, they basically asked the people to evoke pain by moving their back around in a way that would bring about pain levels, I think from one to four. And they randomly asked that to do them to do that. I and thought when we looked at the supplement file, there was actually a picture of the intervention team kicking them in the back. <laughs> this is not true. We're going to, you're opening <laughs> us to libel now. This is not true. <laughs> so for all the lawyers listening, we'll now need a new disclaimer. Um, I'm pretty sure that did not pass ethics. Um, and uh, But yeah, so they did this interesting evoked pain. Um, and then they have this reduction um, in evoked pain, which is very, very interesting compared to usual care. Um, and so this is... And I... We're going to need like a neuroradiologist to like weigh in. I don't know that I understand what they're looking at here at this point, but they're basically trying to identify the regions in the brain that are associated with this pain intensity. Well, here's the thing. As the clinician and as a clinician who sent this article to us. Let's blame Bill. Bill should figure it out. Well, no. Should Bill even care? No, probably not. I think what this is is yeah. Why, why do I care that it's the 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 bilateral insula, the cingulate, the bilateral somatotopic back areas? Why do I care okay. about that? Okay, so I agree, you shouldn't. But I think this is what it's saying, dude. This is freaking crazy. Yeah, and when I'm saying you shouldn't, I'm being tongue in cheek here. Obviously, when it comes to like pain research, is going to help sort of drive more research into those areas and understanding pain. I'm just being very um, sort of blunt with it, if you will, of, of just the no knowing that as a clinician. Disrespectful would be a word um, one might use. To yeah, disrespectful is also another word. To the entire field of neuroradiology, I apologize profusely on behalf of my colleague. Um, <laughs> forgive him. He's a lowly clinician. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> The neuroradiologists are usually considered the gods on high amongst the the doctor class. Um, but uh, no, to your point, right? Like it's like as a clinician, you probably shouldn't care um, or too much. But the I'm just kind of interested in the fact that like we have objective data that things are changing. And so my read of this as a non-neuroradiologist is that they found these regions that are lit up when they evoked the pain initially. And mm -hmm. then they looked at how lit up it was after PRT and compared to controls, it lit, it lights up less. So you're having mm -hmm. actual less brain activity with that uh, evoked pain response. So it's not just a patient reporting that their pain is less. You would think about like, you know, unmasking and blunt, not um, lack of blinding and, and bias and things like that, placebo effects, but like 
actually the brain is responding less acutely, it would seem. That is like mind blowing to me. That is so cool. Um, so I don't know. I think um, it. you're right. Clinically, what we care about is the pain response, mm-hmm. but it's really neat to see that they're showing this objectively and then also, I mean, it also I, yeah. further sort of solidifies is there a causality yes. in, in yes. the, and that's important from an evidence-based standpoint of like, okay, we see that, yes, there's this clinical trial that's showing that there's benefit, but is it, is it actually causal or is there a lot of confounding going on? Mm-hmm. And, I mean, they've done such a good job with their methodology to control for as many confounders as possible, but now yeah. we even have, um, immediate objective data within this trial that is strongly, you know, correlated with, with what we're finding to support these results. So it, you know, it further helps to sort of um, provide more trust in the results that we're seeing. Yeah, totally agree. I think that's the way to look at it. It like, it gives me more confidence that this is real. Um, And, you know, I'll, I don't, I, I shouldn't be geeking about this paper so much, but like, I remember where I was at the Bastyr cafeteria when I first read Wood et al. 2008 paper, first meta-epidemiologic paper I ever read, where he basically showed that lack of blinding shows bias with subjective outcomes, but not objective outcomes. And I just thought that was the most interesting finding I had read hmm. like ever. But until this moment, I've never found, I've always argued that there, we should always try to add objective markers. And then my, my next comment in my lecture on this is like, yeah, but some outcomes like IBS and pain, like they're subjective. So what are you going to do? You know, but this is the first time I've seen a paper really try to address that where it's like, look, there's no way we can blind this. So we're going to think of the two most brilliant, rigorous controls I could possibly imagine. And that is just really reinforces the fact that this is a real effect here. Uh, that we're seeing. So I am like super jazzed. And like, now I want to know what this intervention is and how to, how to order it. The other thing I'd have to say is like, this was their first trial on this. This must've cost a fortune, <laughs> like all these MRI studies yeah. and 150 people randomized. So I don't know. I'm, we should look again at the funding, but like that is a, that's an expensive trial, but like pretty cool to pretty cool to read. And I think too, you know, it's kind of akin to some of these nutrition studies where we're also getting objective markers to see, okay, is that micronutrient level actually increasing in that intervention group? And if we're Mm. seeing these large differences of like, yeah, hey, their omega-3 profiles skyrocketed with this intervention and the placebo group had really no change, then okay, then we have this objective data and not just this, you know, sort of uh, either subjective or by chance findings. Yeah, very cool. I love it. Look, the thing is, we don't do this for money. This is pro bono. And quite honestly, the mothership kind of ekes it out every month or so, right? So we do this because we care about this. We think it's important. We think that integrating evidence-based medicine and integrative medicine is essential and there just aren't other resources out there. The moment we find something that does it better, we'll probably drop it. We're busy folks. But right now, this is what's out there. Unfortunately, that's it. And so we're going to keep on fighting that good fight. And if you believe in that, if you believe in intellectual honesty in the profession and in integrative medicine and being an integrative provider and bringing that into the integrative space, please help us. And you can help us by becoming a member on Dr. Journal Club. If you're in need of continuing education credits, take our NANSIAC approved courses. We have ethics courses, pharmacy courses, general courses. Interact with us on social media. Listen to the podcast. Rate our podcast. Tell your friends. These are all ways that you can sort of help support the cause. I find this very useful. Uh, If you're a listener and you know about this therapy, Please write in and let us know or leave us a voicemail because we'd love to play it on the show. This is new to me, although it sounds like Adam is aware of this type of approach. Is that that fair to say? Yeah, and so it'd be interesting to see if this specific type of therapy um, is is what's necessary, if there's any sort of specific treatment effects from pain reprocessing therapy in the way that they've outlined it here, Mm. or if any sort of general pain counseling, pain education um, would, would also suffice. And so I think perhaps one next step with this trial, um, or a couple of next steps you can consider one 
even though this is one year and that's really long uh, for you know this type of trial, getting longer data, like if we had a five-year follow-up, that I think that would be really cool. Um, You're never satisfied. What about never satisfied? <laughs> a year follow-up data? No, it's very good. On the pain I'm not, trial? I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> that's awesome. If we had five years. Forget the MRIs. I want five years here. No, I'm not. I'm not <laughs> doubting it. I just, I just think it would be really interesting to see. You know, is it sustainable long term, and can we maintain these, uh, maintain these impressive findings? Um, yeah. Other things to consider: their their baseline scores were were a four. So, mm -hmm. if someone was coming in at you know between an eight and a ten, would that provide that larger be. magnitude of effect? Um, or not effective, or not effective. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Don't what know. about in a setting of like acute emergency pain, but not, you know, you get people who go to the emergency room with, with 10 out of 10 back pain, but there's no actual life threatening sort of, of ETI well, yeah, identified. So and so does that, would it work in that setting? Um, and then the last thing would be comparing it to other f types of pain education, if you will. One last thing that I did want to uh, mention which, which, again, we talked about briefly, is like how sticky the pain response was, even for usual care and and for the placebo. And that is just counter to everything I've heard about placebo effects, like in general, but also the fact that the intervention lasted that long. Like, that's very interesting to me because if it is a learned thing that patients are learning, right, they're learning this treatment and how to think about pain and reprocessing, that makes sense that that would be a sticky result. But what's interesting is that the pain response in placebo group was also sticky. That that is like counter to how I'm used to thinking about placebos. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Um, one of these days we should do a Ted Kapchuk paper on placebo response and nocebos and open label placebos. That whole stuff. Well, is fascinating. let's level up and let's have Ted Kapchuk on this podcast. We know he's an avid listener. I uh, my heart just fluttered when you said that I would be such a I am such a fanboy. I heard him talk once. Um, he's a really neat. Do you know that like he used to be like this acupuncturist, traditional Chinese medicine guy, went to China in like the 70s. Oh, wow. Oh, hey, Theo. Yeah. For those who don't know, Josh's son just got home from school. Who And Josh is <laughs> even though Josh's son is only like five, he's already won several NIH award grants. <laughs> Oh, wow. That's so awesome. Oh, my goodness. Okay. That's awesome. Okay, I'm going to be right back. I want to hear all about that, okay? Do not edit any of this out. Awesome. That's <laughs> awesome, Theo. Okay. Be right back, buddy. All right. Hold on one sec. We're not editing any of that out, by the way. I'm fine with that. Theo should make his... That'll be his first appearance. <laughs> okay. Um... What were we talking about? Sorry about that, dear listeners. Um, I love working from home. And I wouldn't even say that was a downside of working from home. I got to see him in my work day. Do you remember when there was like that politician? I think it was it was in England and he was he was on like CNBC or some one of the big major like news platforms and his kid just came like oh, rushing awesome. in, like screaming and like the name he was in the background, just like face was like completely that. like Yeah, I love shocked. that. I think that's great. It's like so much fun to um, I've had Theo bust in on like a, a, a patient uh, encounter once and I was like, oh, that's probably a little bit too much, but this is, this is cool. Um, all right. So um, what else should we talk about? I think that's it. Oh yeah. Ted Kapchuk. So this is, this is really cool. So he wrote the book, uh, The Web That Has No Weaver, which is a book, a great book on traditional Chinese medicine. And, and I might be butchering this and you could probably fact check me on Wikipedia, but essentially like my understanding is he was like big hippie, went to China in the seventies before it was a thing learned acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine, and then became obsessed with um, the placebo response and did some brilliant acupuncture studies. Um, one of my favorite studies, teaching examples of all time, was a paper that he did um, in the BMJ uh, on basically sham, placebo, uh, sham acupuncture and placebo responses. Anyway, since then, he's been at Harvard in the quote-unquote placebo lab and just done incredible work like MRI studies on placebo response, open placebo, looking at placebo response, if the pills are different colors, like there's all sorts of crazy stuff with the brain. And he's trying to tease apart how these things work as well as nocebos too. So um, anyway, I find him like a fascinating guy. I heard him talk once, blew my mind, of course. And yeah, that'd be cool. We should totally get him on the pod. That'd be great. Cool, cool. Awesome. All right. Um, thank you for listening. And 
we will see you next time. I think we're going to, we have a couple of really neat pods coming up. Um, some great topics, some great articles that y'all have sent our way. And also we have some neat guests that I think would be really fun. So there's a, um, a small supplement company who's like trying to do research. And we thought it might be interesting to like talk to them about their perspective of it with all of our conversations around um, ethics and conflict of interest and uh, industry research, et cetera. So um, that might be a fun conversation as well. Any last uh, minute words of the wise? And then you're leaving in like 30 minutes to go move across the country or something crazy like this, right? Yeah. So first I'm going up to Seattle tonight to hang out uh, with a friend um, and then tomorrow morning, I'm actually presenting at a conference, um, Northwest Regional Primary Care Association. It's a big uh, primary care conference. So I'm giving a talk there on nice. food as medicine programs within community health clinics and federally qualified health centers. And um, really also talking about how uh, NDs uh, are perfect fits for these kind of roles and talking about the evidence behind that, highlighting a lot of of the work that actually you've 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 worked on in some of your BMJ papers, work done by Dr. Ryan Bradley, uh, nice. highlighting um, some work done by CCNM uh, with their Sweet. postal worker and their cardiovascular disease yeah. risks. Um, those are some some good papers there. Some good papers. Um, and I'm I'm there with an awesome team of um, another ND, PhD, and an MD, and so we're just kind of giving like a roundtable talk. Um, so I'm really excited about that and uh, excited nice. to meet some people there. And then after that, I'm road tripping across the country to Vermont where I'm setting up shop. That is really cool. Um, so do you want to send Michelle the link and she can put it in the show notes for for the conference? And maybe if they have a recording or something, too, that would be neat. Because that sounds like a really cool conference that probably a lot of yeah, our awesome. listeners we'll would want to see. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a safe travels, uh, Adam. And I'll talk to you next time when you are awesome. in Vermont. All righty. Take care, everyone. Thank you. If you enjoy this podcast, chances are that one of your colleagues and friends probably would as well. Please do us a favor and let them know about the podcast. And if you have a little bit of extra time, even just a few seconds, if you could rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts or any other distributor, it would be greatly appreciated. It would mean a lot to us and help get the word out to other people that would really enjoy our content. Thank you. Hey, y'all, this is Josh. You know, we talked about some really interesting stuff today. I think one of the things we're going to do that's relevant, there is a course we have on Dr. Journal Club called the EBM Boot Camp that's really meant for clinicians to sort of help them understand how to critically evaluate the literature, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the things that we've been talking about today. Go ahead and check out the show notes link. We're going to link to it directly. I think it might be of interest. Don't forget to follow us on social and interact with us on social media at Dr. Journal Club, DR Journal Club on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're on LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera. So please reach out to us. We always love to talk to our fans and our listeners. If you have any specific questions you'd like to ask us about research, evidence, being a clinician, et cetera, don't hesitate to ask. And then, of course, if you have any topics that you'd like us to cover on the pod, please let us know as well. Thank you for listening to the Dr. Journal Club podcast the show that goes under the hood of evidence-based integrative medicine. We review recent research articles, interview evidence-based medicine thought leaders, and discuss the challenges and opportunities of integrating evidence-based and integrative medicine. Be sure to visit www.drjournalclub.com to learn more.